I am Andrus Kulikauskas. This is Math for Wisdom, the third in a series of interviews with pioneer of ecotechnology, Jerry Northrup, about the ways he has figured things out throughout his life in ecotechnology. The early days when I was working at the Center for Theoretical Biology and developing the microbial tank farm. And the notion was, uh, how do you build a new agricultural system? And then the idea was, let's use resources that currently are being used. And so the notion was, let's harvest weeds, which mm -hmm. are considered to be a problem. Mm -hmm. People pay money to get rid of weeds and that sort of stuff and send Let's collect those and use those as the basis of the food source. So we mm -hmm. grow microbes on the on the weeds and then feed a microbial biomass to, to minnows. That was kind of where I was was starting with that. The notion of using uh, what we call a liability as an asset. Yeah. So that uh, came to be a, a, a real interest when I was then working for the wastewater treatment plant. Mm -hmm. And wastewater treatment plants are big costs, and they really don't provide a benefit. So you pay money to get rid of a problem. And the notion was uh, a lot of environmental problems were not addressed very well because of the cost. Mm -hmm. That's that's the big thing. Why pay money to clean up something when we could just dump it into the river? Yeah, or, ignore it. <laughs> hole or something, you know, out of sight, out of my eyes, flush mm -hmm. it down the toilet, who cares? As long as it doesn't stink at my house. Right. Uh, so the notion was, if you really want to try and, and deal with environmental issues, let's try and make a waste treatment system so that they actually don't cost, they, they can pay for themselves or even generate a profit. And so that became a big motivator for, for buy-on. When we started to work with that initially when i left the wastewater plant and jen and i started by uh, uh we were we were focusing on just treating environmental issues and uh, it was suggested by some people at monsanto that we look at the um, phosphorus pollution lake okeechobee down mm -hmm. in florida mm -hmm. and and so we did that we went down and looked at, and I'd been developing different variety of different phosphorus removal processes uh, while I was at the town and we patented one of them, gave the town rights to use it if they wanted to. But so, so we went down and looked at that and uh, there was a clear need for that, but there was resistance to doing it because initially the South Florida Water Management District was setting up, you know, fines for pollution. Mm -hmm. And it was driving the dairy farmers out of business. Mm -hmm. And so they were moving away from the Lake Okeechobee watershed mm -hmm. uh, because of the extra cost. And we came in with this way to really virtually eliminate the phosphorus runoff from them. Um, but it was an expense. And that was still an issue to get, get the systems applied. So we came up with this notion of processing the manure in such a way that you trap the phosphorus into the solids mm -hmm. and then harvest those and you can then sell the product. So we thought that as as fertilizer or as, as a fertilizer type mm -hmm. of thing. So we, we set up this notion of let's do buy-in soil. And we'd have this low oxygen we set up this process where you use this low oxygen nitrification, denitrification mm -hmm. to trap the nutrients in the biomass. Mm -hmm. And you trap a lot of the organic fiber and stuff that comes mm -hmm. with the manure. Mm -hmm. And so you then have something that you could, uh, it's a slow release fertilizer, it doesn't smell, mm -hmm. and you can sell it. So we started to do that. You. You'd harvest this stuff. We'd harvest it with bulldozers. You'd go mm -hmm. and you'd mm -hmm. get these big uh, lagoon shallow cells. We call them eco reactors, and you load them up with these solids, and then you could harvest those out, and you could bag them, and you could sell the bags for 
three dollars a bag. Mm -hmm. and so a, a pallet would would be, you know, a, a reasonable amount of money, and that would generate an income stream that would pay for the uh, phosphorus removal resolution for the problem that the farmers had. So that you know they wouldn't wouldn't be fined because they're discharging phosphorus levels, and the system would pay for itself. That was the notion. Uh, the problem with that was that it's a it's a weak economic model because almost all of your uh, earnings go to um, processing and transporting and marketing the mm -hmm. product. Mm -hmm. uh, so you could do it, but it, it wasn't attractive to the venture capitalists and what mm -hmm. have you, mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. But that was that was the idea. You turn a liability into an asset, so that you. You could do it, and that could apply to fruit processing plants, any kind of vegetable processing plants as well. But it was it was still a hard sell because you'd have to do all this stuff, and then you'd make some income, and and it wasn't uh, wasn't that attractive as a business model. It would work, but there wasn't mm -hmm. the big incentive of it. So one of the basic reasons I left Bion was to try and say, well. If if we just try and sell the soil, mm -hmm. that's a lot of bagging and transporting and that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, what if we make a, a more concentrated, higher value products such as fish? Mm -hmm. And that's what I wanted to do: was to say, okay, let's let's get rid of the buy-in soil, convert the buy-in soil into fish. So now instead of paying all that Ooh. transportation and processing stuff to move the manure from the farm into the stores and bags, uh, you're producing a, a product that you can sell for a lot more. It's not $3 a 40 pound bag, it's $5 a pound. And it's a much smaller package and, and transportation is less of an issue and, and what have you, uh, brief and break. Here. These are beautiful examples, um, but now, um... Like I was saying, the continent doesn't matter, you know, the decade doesn't matter, but your personal um, logic, not just the logic of the ecology, but your personal logic, your brother's logic, you know, your company logic, the customer logic, you see, that's very important. So that's all coming out. And right. so some kind of principles I was asking about, they just seem at play here. Like, for example, the idea that uh, local usage and local cycles are going to have a value over global larger cycles because right. for example transportation costs transportation. etc right so that's one principle that may not be how you figure things out but it's kind of related to how you're figuring things out um, in terms of and another one is uh what they call a uh, upstream you know so like you're saying if we can convert you know the this um bio soil into actual product right ourselves why do we need to ship it you know across the state right that, so that was one of the major arguments in timberfish is that the average unit of seafood that's consumed in the United States mm -hmm. travels a distance of an average of 5,400 miles. From yeah, where it is for example. Right. Where it is eaten. So there's shelf life issues, there's transportation issues, there's all that sort of stuff. Whereas a local facility that you could produce a million pounds of fish, fish with 60 mm -hmm. square miles of forest. So if you've got you've got forests all over the place, so you set these local systems up, all that transportation, shelf life issues tend to disappear. So that's part of that kind of thinking. And there was another uh, couple of um, things that are very deep and important to flesh out uh, was this idea that, well, you're going to start a business. So like you kind of figured out that, you know, the things that you want to do that you're pulled to are not being... Um, served in the wastewater treatment environment you know that you were that's one issue and then so then all of a sudden this idea that okay you're going to start your own enterprise you're going to start your own but then you have to worry about the economics of it it becomes very real right like so how right. do you do that economics and so maybe that's two different things like the first is your philosophical view that you have certain kind of philosophical principles or values or interests or intellectual curiosities and then how does that, so that's one thing to kind of flesh out more. And then the other is like, okay, you're going to start a business. 
how are you going to make that viable, right? Like a whole bunch of things. And so I think yeah. in terms of eco-technology, all these things become part of the piece of the puzzle. So it's all part of what it, could you yeah. say about all that? Uh, uh, yeah, that well, that's the motivation now for, for looking at this extension of the logic, which runs a specific timber system, mm -hmm. expand that to a local uh, sustainable green circular economy. So mm -hmm. if you say you're going to put a timber fish system in a place like like Westfield, which is mm -hmm. where our existing system is, well, there's a lot of forest and land around that. Mm -hmm. and so you say now you could have this as a local uh, economic entity, mm -hmm. which can solve waste problems for the farmers and the breweries and the mm -hmm. wine makers and stuff like that solves uh, um, the environmental problem of, of making sure that the discharge in the lake area is clean. It doesn't mm -hmm. add any phosphorus there. It produces local jobs. You set up a structure so that the people in the community can buy options to purchase the fish mm -hmm. so that everybody in the local community gets uh, an option of first chance, a right of first refusal for the fish and anything mm -hmm. that's excess is produced can be sold, put on a, a train, sent to New York City or Buffalo or wherever, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. So now you've got a, a functioning economic unit. Mm -hmm. And if it's big enough, it produces you know a couple million pounds of fish a year. Mm -hmm. uh, you can actually generate enough electricity to run the process and, and put some back into the local grid. Mm -hmm. So you, you've got this kind of a unit now, which if you could prevent venture capital coming in and say, wow, this is great. We're going to fund this. We're going to own this facility and we're going to ship all the fish to New York City. Mm -hmm. So then there's there's minimal benefit. I mean, there's jobs and that sort of stuff. So people do that. But the notion of, of trying to incentivize local installations all across the country, all across the world, and, and make it... Um, sustainable for the local economy, both in terms of the production of the food and the energy and what have you, um, in addition to the to the job, so that you resist the takeover by the large financial interests who are going mm -hmm. to then make decisions as to what's good for New York City and not what's good for Westfield. Um, and, so and you can resolve those kinds of issues with that kind of a, an economic sociological structure. And so there's like, you know, typical economic ways of figuring things out, basically, you know, like what's uh, cost effective and what's not. But there's also, like you're saying, um, this uh, critical analysis of people's um, motives and how the incentive structure, you know, what are the consequences of the incentive structure, so to speak, right? right. So yeah. how would you, maybe you could say more about like how that kind of... Um, works Actually, that kind of figuring thing. you know how do you figure that all out what's i've got a, a pretty detailed write-up on that in terms of this what i call the fish option program mm -hmm. they actually have a domain name fishbit.com uh, so, but be... but in terms of like how do you when you criticize uh, or critically analyze let's say venture capital you know which has done has had let's say lots of successes and some maybe some great failures too but but so in your critical analysis, like, where is that coming from? Like, what are you noticing or what are you picking up on? How are you looking at that in your analysis? Well, that, this comes back to my obsession with extreme wealth inequality. Mm -hmm. The goal of, of venture capital is to make money. Right. That's the bottom line, that's the driver. That is going to, to underline all the major decisions that are made. And that leads to this concentration of wealth in the, in the hands of a few, uh, which is not good. And I argue that that is the basic cause of climate change. It but so is, let's just step. But let's just step back. Like when you say that's not good, how did you figure out that that's not good? Well, you you uh, you you look at. We have this gross national product, and mm -hmm. how. That's the amount of money that, that is made sure. by the economy and the nation or what have you. How is that distributed amongst the people who do the work and, and mm -hmm. all of that sort of stuff? 
And the model we have now, which underlines this whole venture capital type of, of thinking, is to concentrate that wealth in the hands of a few. And this is at the expense of the majority of people, of the, of the poor people and, and what have you. Uh, if you were to take the resources of the 2,000 so billionaires and take that money away and spread it around for the bottom 50% of the human population, you double their standard of living. Okay, so, so how do you justify that kind of concentration at the expense of a few people, or at the expense of large numbers of people? Okay, so that's that's getting closer to what I'm looking for is like the uh, way of figuring things out has to do like with justification. So like justification of resource allocation and the principle yeah. of uh, justification is like, well, how does this benefit everybody, right? Like everybody. that. Right. That a good solution should benefit everybody. Right. Are, are all people created equal? Do they have a basic right to at least some fraction of the world's resources? Or are they going to depend upon the 2,000 billionaires as to what they get for what they Yeah, get? and I think I'm trying to divorce your ways of figuring things out oh. from, let's say, your conclusions or your even value systems or whatever. But okay. like... So like the fact that people are equal doesn't really seem to be important for this observation. You know, they could be equal or not. But what you seem to be caring about is like, like well, people should be, in, they should not be dependent, right? That there's something intrinsically unhealthy. Like yeah. if everyone is dependent on these venture capitalists, right? That yeah. doesn't sound like a good system, right? No. Like that, right. So that's a that's a epistemological point of view, like to say like, that's that that like you're analyzing like well, in a healthy system everyone is independent, right? Yeah. And it's like interdependent and independent. But like that there's people have uh, in a healthy system resources are distributed so that every part is able to have some security, let's say, or have right. some right. I'm not arguing against wealth inequality because I think some of that is is very right. important. As some people do a lot more, but other people don't want to do anything. I do believe that everybody has a certain basic right to food, shelter, clothing, that kind of stuff. And, and that's on, well, so one level is that everybody has a, like, and maybe right is the proper word, like everyone, but everyone should have, a, everyone should be taken care of. Well, maybe that's too strong, but everyone should, um, There should be consideration for everyone, basically. Like, how is everyone affected, right? Yeah. So how is everyone doing? Maybe put it that way. Like, we need to be looking at how everyone is doing. Right. And then I don't know if this is true or not in your analysis, but like, well, it kind of relates to this idea of local solution that like, okay, yeah. people should be able to take care of themselves first. Right. Right. Like, so if people are not able to take care of themselves, they need to be dependent on others. There's a there's not a perfect solution there. There's like a problematic solution, right? Like any kind of thing where you need oh. external, you know, reliance. Yeah. There's a certain fraction of society that can't actually take care of themselves. That yeah, which is right. And then that's, so, so it's a separate have, thing. And so this criteria an that, that everybody should be, um, we should be worrying like how everyone is doing. So first of all, we yeah. should worry how everyone is doing. Right. And then uh, in terms of uh, caring for people, the Priorities that they should be able to, you know, if they can take care of themselves, that's good, right? And so are they able to take care of themselves, right? And yeah. then this idea of additional resources, you know, which is you have all these resource flows. Like, are the resource flows making people more resilient or less resilient? Like this idea of resilience, I guess, right? Like mm -hmm. resource flows should make people more resilient. Is that... Yeah. And, and uh, nature should be more resilient, right? Like it should not, I don't know if that's... Well, they, nature is resilient. Well, and so with eco-technology, you're looking at systems that are kind of like semi-natural, right? Like yeah. they're probably not going to be as, res they're not as resilient as nature, right? Because they're, you know, they're made out of concrete or they're made yeah. out, you know, like they're, they're just, uh, but... Um, yeah. Well, but, that, 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 I think this trade gets into the larger sociological types mm -hmm. of issues. Uh, let's wait on that. Let me give you some more specifics. Yeah, about go ahead. 
how this works at the, at the local practical sort of level. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, to go back to, we have a timber fish system. And so we are producing different kinds of organisms in different parts of the system, mm -hmm. different places in the tank or in additional tanks that are going around. So then the notion is, how do you use the abilities of the organisms that are there to maximum advantage? Mm -hmm. So like one of the examples- And that's a, that's a way of figuring things out. Yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah so we we use maximum advantage. Right? One of the ways we're going to do that is we'll put a perch biofilter on top of a fish tank. Mm -hmm. So we'll run the, the waste stream from the bottom of the fish tank back up, let it percolate through these wood chips to then drip back into the tank. And, and that cleans up the water. Mm -hmm. That will trap some of the fish waste and mm -hmm. put it back up to the, the wood chips. And it will take some of, the, some of the nitrogen and phosphorus that's excreted by the fish solubly and make it available to the microorganisms that are living in the, in the wood chip biofilter. Mm -hmm. Now, if you put worms in the biofilter, they will continue to eat the microbes. So the microbes then have a lot of stuff that they will continue to grow and play the space. But then the worms will reach a certain population and they'll start to move and they'll drop into the fish tank. So now we've used the mobility feature of the worms so that we don't have to harvest them. Mm. We just set it up that excess worms will drop into the fish tank. Mm. So that's a way of using that kind of capability. Mm -hmm. um, another example that's sort of like that is when we did a field trial down at the Freshwater Institute in West Virginia back in 2010, 2011. Uh, and we had you know, this, this biomass, this big biofilter and what have you. And there were all these microbes growing out of it. And so there were a lot of bugs that would come mm -hmm. in flies land on it and the lay eggs and then there'd be flies going around. So the maintenance guys down there didn't like that. So we said, well, let's put a, a bug zapper right over the fish tank. Oh. So the bug zapper would, would eliminate the flies or greatly reduce the occurrence of flies and the dead flies would fall into the fish tank and it would be mm -hmm. another way of, of providing food for them. For the fish, so that's another way of, of looking at the system. What is the problem given the functioning of the system? How can we use the actors we have available to us to solve that problem in a way that that benefits everybody? Uh, yeah, that's fantastic examples. I wanted to um, ask also um, a crucial thing. When you left the wastewater uh, treatment plant and started a business, right? Like what was going on in your mind that kind of like led you to make that decision? What's the, what was the decision-making process for that? Uh, well, that, that's an interesting and somewhat complicated story. Uh, mm -hmm. I had a great situation at the wastewater treatment plant. Uh, I had this PhD and everybody thought I knew everything about biology. And I was in charge of, of the operation of it and the lab. And my mm -hmm. boss was the plant superintendent. He actually was a history major. Oh. He put himself through college by running a wastewater treatment plant or an operator at a wastewater treatment plant. And he was tied into the local politics, so he became plant superintendent. Uh, but he was working on an MBA, mm -hmm. and he handled the politics of the town, and I ran the plant. It worked mm -hmm. out great all the way around, and, and I did a really mm -hmm. great job on the plant. Uh, but I had probably a management style that was not compatible, particularly with the way the town likes to do business. Mm -hmm. So most of the people that were hired to work at the treatment plant were so-and-so uh, who's on the town board, has a son-in-law, can't find a job, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. send him down and he'll work at the treatment plant. Mm -hmm. So when I first started there, they 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 gave me, we, we had roughly 80 people working at the plant. Uh, about 40 of them were going to be in operations. Mm -hmm. And they gave me people who couldn't read. Mm -hmm. and we had this big, sophisticated uh, plant that produced oxygen, 50 tons a day. And, and you know, that's 
that's a dangerous sort of plant to have. And you'd have people going mm -hmm. around taking readings and have somebody who can't read. Uh, that doesn't work. Mm -hmm. So I would, I would make sure that they got allocated to other areas or what mm -hmm. have you in terms of just operating the, the treatment plant. And, but the, the, what is it's the, an, it's an example of how, how you deal with nature and environment to achieve a specific end. So you set up a, a genetic ex selection procedure. If you wanted a type of bacteria that's going to do a certain fermentation, mm -hmm. you find that bacteria. You, you set up a condition in nature where it will encourage their growth. And then you try and, and isolate the bug that will do it. You get a, a mixed culture with all kinds of bacteria that are fermenting. I mean, I mean, it, it brings to mind like where you said, well, you know, in order to populate your pond, you just go to the creek and you get some, exactly. you know, a spoon, exactly you know, I mean, a fistful of mud and throw it in, and then you're, you, you know, just wait a week or something, there. you know, like is that right? Or yeah. that's, that's if you meet somebody you like, that that's great. That's how it works. Yeah. But if not, yeah, it's the next week. <laughs> right. Okay, and so um, there will be a lot, you know, and maybe I'll think about it more. In the, but in terms of analyzing, um, especially the previous example, like there's all these, you know, because ecotechnology is a lot about the um, parallelism between ecology, technology, sociology, let's say, and then maybe personal philosophy, like which is very uh, clear in your life, right? So it resonates across. And so here in sociology, you see that, well, there's something to be said about patronage, you know, where people care, like who's going to get a job, you know, and so they, there's a yeah. network of people like, or I know in my life, um, you know, I, my resume is not any good for me to get jobs. You know, I have to get jobs through people I know. Right. So this idea yeah. that, you know, you get jobs through connections, that's an alternate way. That's really quite common. Yeah. Uh, so that's on the one hand, that's sensible. On the other hand, you have this conflict like, okay, but, but uh, what if, you have a demanding environment, you know, or like, or a, a challenge, you know, challenging environment where like in the good sense that like you want a challenging environment, right? Like, right. so that runs across like these organisms that don't want to be these people who don't want to be challenged, let's say, right. Or who yeah. aren't designed to be challenged. Right. So how do you, how do you, what do you do then? And, and um, especially in the case, like in the human case, you're not allowed to say, well, they'll just die off. <laughs> you know, like you, yeah. you have to, you have to uh, be more kind than that. So, um, so how do you figure things out in that sense? I guess, and that was uh, that was maybe a. I guess maybe one way to look at that is to say, well, you died off in a certain sense. Like you know, you you allowed yourself to fail. You yeah. did not adapt to that. You kind of allowed yourself to be filtered out. I think that was that's one process, right? Like to say. You know, you didn't fight that culture. You allow that culture to kind of like push you out. Right. Well, like, I, I definitely opted out for what I consider to be a better alternative. You know, or you looked for better alternatives. You know, or you, you were willing to let go because other people would have yeah. clung to that. You said like there was so many things great for it. You but, could have fought for that, clung for that. But you you yeah, decided to that, let go and to allow yourself to be transplanted. So another way to say it, instead of you forcing the environment to go to the environment that that wants yeah. you. Right. I, I could have stayed because I could have easily acclimated to the politics and, and what have you. And I had a I had a tremendous situation in that I didn't have to spend much time running the plant. I had it lined out so it would do really well. But you would but you would be okay, so you could have, but you would have been a slightly different person as a result, I think. Oh yeah, and, I would have had to have been more uh, politically I'm not subservient, but compatible with the town. Or sensitive, policy. yeah. Yeah. You'd become very... I wasn't, wasn't interested in doing that. And so some people develop that way, though. They become very suave and, and tactful right. and sensitive. And, you know, they, they do it that way. You know, they, they kind of focused or whatever. They sell out um, in a way. But one thing that seems to be in, in figuring your life out that uh, you realized, oh, this, you looked at your life as kind of like in terms of phases to say, well, I had a good 10 years. Yeah. And is there more to life than this? So one way yeah. to figure it out is like, you know, I think that's something like that was a driver in you, like to say, well, I could be doing something new or more or different, or like yeah. I could, 
So how do, what was that all about? I mean, in what sense were well, you inspired? I, I tended to go through kind of 10 year cycles. That's yeah. when I went to college. I loved college. And I stayed in college and graduate school and a postdoc for 10 years. Mm -hmm. And then I, I spent almost 10 years on what I called independent research. Mm -hmm. And I didn't, didn't have a job. Lynn worked for the bulk of that as a toy designer at Fisher Price. Mm -hmm. And then when we decided to have our daughter, that wasn't viable. And so mm -hmm. after she was born, we didn't go back to Fisher Price and I got the job with the town of, of Amherst. Mm -hmm. And I've been looking around for quite some time trying to sell the technology that was being developed. So then I spent 10 years with the town. So it's 10 years in academia, 10 years in independent study, 10 years with the town, then left to form Bion. Mm -hmm. And the first 10 years with Bion, which John and I were really running it, and, and it was it was going, but it was uh, my brother who was doing the, the business aspect of it ran into some real medical problems. Mm -hmm. And so we brought in some outside management. Mm -hmm. And I stayed on to help with a bit, but I didn't care for the direction of the outside management because again, the goal suddenly became to make a lot of money and not do. And so we just have a couple of minutes, but is there a theme here, like where you pick up a new thing or you like let go of the old thing? Like, how are you it figuring seems, that out? To it seems to evolve in roughly ten year. Right, but like, what's the driving inside of you? Like, what's the kind of question or uh, or 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 approach that's driving that look at like the look at your life, right? Like, what are you seeing that makes you do I, that? I think that's a, a cyclical approach on understanding the sophistication. So that each of these intervals, I learn a certain skill set, a certain environmental stuff, and then it's on. To how that okay, so you you master stuff. a certain you master a certain um, role, let's say, or a certain yeah. kind of like, a, and then you become interested in transcending that, like in a new way, right? Is yeah, that, you know, that's a, a way of figuring things out. A lot of way that's that's uh, catalyzed by external forces. For example, uh, timberfish, uh, which we started in two thousand eight by two thousand nineteen. Uh, that was really beginning to roll, but I got really sick with this respiratory type of stuff, which I'd had all my life, but that mm -hmm. became serious. And then, so we kind of mothballed the system for the winter in the fall of 2019, and then COVID hit. And I realized that uh, if I came down with COVID, I was not going to survive mm -hmm. because of the respiratory thing. So I basically stopped any kind of things operating it and because none of us were getting so, paid i couldn't really feel right asking anybody else to go work it so i have to we conclude for today we'll meet again i thank you i pray for your health i pray for uh our your knowledge and this has uh, been really sweet and wonderful totally thank great. you i'm very excited about it I'm very pleased how it's going thank you for watching this video Please uh, go to mathforwisdom.com or simply read the description to this video to learn how you can join our Math for Wisdom discussion group and our study groups. Thank you for liking this video, for subscribing to this YouTube channel, and for supporting Math for Wisdom through Patreon. I'm a Patreon supporter for Math for Wisdom because Andres and I have been friends for a long time, most of our lives. And the conversations I've had with him over the years have been very useful for me. Uh, he's also a big, big fan, my supporter, you know, of my work. And um, we just we have deep conversations about math and physics that have been useful for charting the course of my interests. And you know, I'm just I'm grateful, and you know, I I want to support that, and you know, our weekly or bi you know semi weekly or bi weekly conversations have been have been um, very important for me in the last couple of years, especially. So yeah, that's why I'm a supporter.